Joshua chapter 19. Now, this is probably going to be a shorter sermon than what you're used to, and I know every time I say that, it tends to be a, a long sermon, but I really do think, I really honestly think tonight will be a little bit shorter. What we see, just as a, a real brief overview, last week we, we saw that there, was gonna, that there were still seven tribes that still did not go and inherit their land, right? And Josh is, Joshua's just like, well, how long are you going to be slack? You know, like, just go and, and finish it. Just get your land and get settled and be done, right? Get through. So what we're seeing in Joshua 19, it's, you know, um, the, the second lot through the seventh lot. So like all the rest of the land's basically just being divvied up among the, the rest of the tribes that didn't go and inherit their land. So we see Simeon and Asher and Naphtali and Zebulun and Dan and, you know, all these various tribes that didn't go and inherit their land. And it's, you know, kind of splitting them up here. But there's a couple things still in this chapter that I want to cover and go through and things I think we could learn from even within this chapter. Now, some of this is a little bit more broad, but it's kind of touched on in these chapters. So look at verse number one here in Joshua 19. The Bible says, and the, and the second lot came forth to Simeon, even for the tribe of the children of Simeon, according to their families. And their inheritance was within the inheritance of the children of Judah. Now jump down to verse number nine. The Bible says, out of the portion of the children of Judah was the inheritance of the children of Simeon. For the part of the children of Judah was too much for them. Therefore, the children of Simeon had their inheritance within the inheritance of them. Now, there's two times in this chapter where there's adjustments made to the inheritance that's given. In this case, Judah basically had too much. They had a really large portion given to them, and they just really didn't need that much. And Simeon needed a place, you know, so they, they were given the lot within Judah. And then we see at the end of the chapter, Dan didn't have enough room. They needed more space. So they went and invaded another, another area, another territory, and, and got that as their possession also. But what's interesting here is that this is the only tribe, Simeon is literally surrounded completely by Judah. So when it says their inheritance was within the inheritance of Judah, what it is is that their, their whole, all their borders, it's like, a, I mean, just, this isn't the exact shape. I mean, just think of like a donut, right? You got the hole in the middle. Well, that would be like where Simeon's lot was, was that hole, where that hole would be. And then Judah's surrounding that whole section. So they're literally found within the other tribe. And that's very unique. We don't see that happening in other places. Turn, if you would, to Judges chapter 1. And we're going to get into this a little bit more. And, and, and what I want to kind of cover is just a biblical concept here. Um, before I get into that, though, I just want to point out this story in Judges chapter 1, verse number 1. The Bible reads, Now after the death of Joshua came to pass that the children of Israel asked the Lord, saying, Who shall go up for us against the Canaanites first to fight against them? And the reason why they're asking is because they still hadn't gone and finished inheriting their land. So Joshua died, and they still needed to go. And, and you know, because what we're reading in Joshua 19 is they're done with all their big battles. They're done with all the major warfare that they went around and they fought all these various kings and they, you know, and they did this. But there were still Canaanites around. There were still people of the land. They were still there. So they didn't have to necessarily do these huge major wars and this big campaign like they had earlier in the book of Joshua. But there were still battles to be fought. Joshua ended up dying. In Joshua 19, we see this is where they finally just finished. Just like, look. Here is your land, like here's the inheritance, go and do this and be done and don't be slack and get this through. So Joshua dies before they ever even fully finish their task. So Joshua dies and in Judges 1 they're saying, well, okay, Lord, you know, who should we send up first to go and, and you know, fight these battles now? Because their leader is dead. They have, you know, they're, they're looking for guidance. Verse number two says, and the Lord said, Judah shall go up. Behold, I have delivered the land in his hand. So he's saying, well, send Judah. In verse number three, Judah said unto Simeon, his brother, come up with me into my lot that we may fight against the Canaanites and I likewise will go with thee into thy lot. So Simeon went with them. And when you understand just the composition of what was given, the inheritance was given him, it makes sense that Judah is saying, you know, because I often wonder, like, why did Judah want Simeon to go with them? But when you understand just the whole geography, it makes perfect sense. Hey, we're, we're basically, you know, they're essentially sharing the land together, even though they had their own borders. So he's saying, well, hey, why don't you come up with me? You know, help me fight my battles and I'll help you fight your battles. Well, let's get this whole thing 
knocked out. And that makes perfect sense for them to have done that. Because Judah still went up. Because when I first read that, I'm thinking, like, it sounded like Judah's, like, maybe going against God's word. We're saying, well, Judah should go up first. But I actually don't think that's the case. I think it's just a practical thing to do is just say, hey, come up with me. You know, fight with me and we'll, and we'll help fight, you know, your battles and uh, we'll look after each other in that sense. Now, but what I really want to get into, we go back to, to Joshua 19. Or actually, turn, if you would, to Leviticus 19 because we're going to head there next. Um, and again, this is just going to be kind of a brief study of this. But, but what, one of the things that came to my mind is, you know, God gave them this inheritance within a whole nother tribe. And the Bible is very clear about borders. There are borders established within the whole nation of Israel. And each, you know, we'll just call them state for each tribe, right? And God is outlining, hey, from, from the river to the sea to this city to this city and just, and just giving you the details and saying these are the borders. Now, I'm going to try not to get too political tonight, but we, we derive what we believe politically from the truth of the Bible and from the truth of God's words. And that's where it should come from. I mean, when we know what's right, that should reflect in what we believe about everything, right? The scripture is our foundation of truth. And when we see that God is putting, I mean, there's definitely an importance given here on specific nations existing in the world and those nations having borders and those nations being independent and sovereign from other nations. This is the way that God designed it. And the reason, one of the reasons why I bring this up is because there's a, lot of, there's a lot of different philosophies out there and philosophies of men that we need to be aware of and watch out for. Because some of them sound good. Some of them line up with the truth for a while, but then they kind of depart from the truth. And anyone who knows me, you know, a little bit or, or I don't know, you, you may or may not know some of my political leanings. Doesn't really matter. I try not to just, you know, um, I don't preach a whole lot about this stuff because politically, I don't think it's very important. I mean, politics is kind of dumb and I, I got into it for a long time and, uh, and I got out of it, thank God, because, um, well, we'll get into that if we have time later, but um, I, I, seriously, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about that a little bit later, I think, but um, I'm not a Republican or a Democrat. I'm neither. I don't like either of them. They're both, they're both two wings of the same bird. They both are, are you know, wanting big government and everything else, and, and, and that's what they're all about. And my political leanings are lean more towards like a libertarian, just let's get the scope of the government in line with God's scope of the government. Because the way that God... The, the laws that God gave for human government to perform the duties of human government is supposed to punish evildoers. And I think that's a very good duty and it's something that needs to be done. And, but what's happening definitely in the United States of America and what tends to happen through all human governments is that many of them, not all of them, many of them may start off kind of good, but then they get really bad and, and start overstepping bounds and accumulating more power. And where we're at today is there's kind of a reversal of, of what the government's even for because the punishment of evildoers, evildoers aren't really being punished the way they ought to be. They're becoming more and more lax and slack on the real criminals, on the murderers, on the rapists, on the pedophiles. They're not getting their just sentence that needs to be carried out by government, the what God said. And then you have people who aren't criminals in the eyes of the Lord, who may be sinners, but they're not criminals. They haven't committed any crime. You know, people that may choose to do drugs, okay, or whatever. They pull a plant out of the ground and they want to get high from that plant. And, you know, now our, our government is just full steam ahead on, on cracking down and getting these people. Now, look. I know there are bad effects from doing drugs. I'm not for doing drugs, so don't get the wrong idea. I'm not up here saying, yeah, we should all just do drugs. 
What I'm saying is it shouldn't be a crime. Let's punish the actual crimes because if someone just sits and gets high, they're, they're hurting themselves. They're going to hurt their families, you know, their stability, their finances, things like that. But unless they actually commit a crime, they're going to transgress against somebody. They're going to, you know, steal from somebody or, you know, fight, like, like injure somebody or whatever. They haven't really committed a crime. They're a sinner. They need to get right with God. They shouldn't be doing drugs. But that's not something that the government should be enforcing. And you could take that. That's just one kind of a major issue. And now you can start to see maybe a little bit why I'm not a Republican or a Democrat. <laughs> because, you know, there's a lot of different, different sides that, that, that typically one party will, will stay. And, you know, it's just a joke anyways because these parties, they claim to stand on one thing. The Republicans, oh, yeah, we're against abortion. Okay, well, what happened when you had a Republican Senate, House, and President? And you had a supermajority. What happened to all these issues that you stand so solid on and you tell your voters that this is what we stand for and this is what we believe in? If you want to end this stuff, then you vote us in. You had, you had all the power that you could ask for. And what happened? I'll tell you what happened. More government happened. More laws, more legislation, more, more taxes. Yeah, under the Republican government, more taxes. Just more stuff, more military, more bombing, more empire building across the world. No, I'm not a Republican and I'm definitely not a Democrat either. They're all for the big government. Democrats want to do all the, all the social services and tax the people, tax the people who are making the money to give to people who, who, who aren't making money and set up all these different programs to become dependent on the government. But you see... That's not the way God designed it either. The government that God designed was for the punishment of evildoers. And guess who were th was there to have compassion and help the people who were truly in need? The church was there to help the people who were truly in need. The widows, the fatherless, the people who really needed help. But see, when you get the government involved... They decide who needs the help, but they don't do it in the right way. They don't administer it properly. See, they're not using the wisdom of Scripture to do it. The wisdom of Scripture is going to say, people need to get right with God first. They need to come to church if they're going to get that. They need to do something for themselves if they can. Right. There's going to be, first of all, we, we, I went over this on Sunday. You know, if, if a man shall not work, neither should he eat. That's going to be enforced in the church. So, but, but think about what that does. You can say, oh man, that sounds harsh. But what's going to help a person more? Helping them fix their character with some tough love and, and, and learning how to, how to provide for themselves or just continuing to just feed them and feed them and feed them like an adult child just, just babying them for the rest of their lives. That is not going to do them any good. And see people come at you with these bleeding hearts, these politicians. Oh, no, we need to help this way. Okay, well, how are you going to do it? You, you want to help those people out? Go ahead. And any of you, you want to take your money and help people out and give it to them because you think you're helping them? It, you know, if they don't want to get a job, you want, go ahead and do that. I'm all for you to have that freedom to spend your money however you want to do. God gives you that freedom with your money to do what, what you want to do. But he doesn't give people the freedom to take the money from everyone else in order just to give it to other people who aren't doing work, that's not found in Scripture. It's not there. Now, why am I even getting off into this whole tangent? <laughs> because it's not really a tangent. So we started with, like, uh, and when I was studying this and kind of thinking on this, how would that work? with a, you know, Simeon being inside of Judah and they have all these borders and they have an established time. And God's kind of important. He's saying, look, these are, this is your inheritance. And there's a lot of rules he put in um, the, the passing down of the inheritance from, from, you know, the fathers to the children and that it can't change from one tribe to another, at least not for an extended period. That's why the year of Jubilee was there. Every 50 years, if land was sold, to someone else, it has to go back. It goes back to the family. It goes back to the tribe where it belongs. So obviously there's importance 
to that land and that borders and, and that structure remaining that way. And part of it has to do with a power structure. God's making sure that nobody is going to get too powerful. Now, there's some laws that we have today on the books that, are, that use that same mentality. It's a good mentality, you know, the, the anti-monopoly type of, of laws to restrict people from just a, accumulating just so much wealth that everyone's going to be dependent and become serfs. You know, I mean, it's, it's kind of an extreme, but, but that's kind of the, the, the reasoning here. Because over time, you can have a family just continue to uh, um, accumulate wealth and accumulate substance and accumulate land. And, you know, just given, using this, the, the nation of Israel as an example, if you had a family kind of going and just buying up land and buying up land, well, what are you going to do? The people are going to end up paying rent to the person who's the landowner of, all, of that whole area. God didn't want that to happen. And one of the ways he prevented that was by having, no, the land is, is going to continue and stay within the family, so you can't do that. You can buy it up again, but see, then you have to keep paying that money out, right, to, to, to equal out the, the, the balance there. And that never happened where anyone was able to, to just take over that whole area. And that's just, one, that's just one reason and one example. And one of the reasons I bring this up is because a lot of Christians who, who, who love God and, and love the, you know, God's ways might be, um, get really involved with, say, like libertarianism. Now, like I said, I lean libertarian because I'm all for freedom. I'm all for little government and, and a lot of freedom to the individual to do what you want to do. And I think that lines up with the Bible. Th those, there's many aspects that, yeah, they line up perfectly. But then where you know, some of this goes too far, you, you, you take these things to their philosophical ends and you listen to these people who you know, maybe they're, they're anarcho-capitalists or whatever you want to call them, right? Libertarians, you have capital L and small L libertarians and the whole thing, and it just turns into kind of a, almost a bunch of nonsense. But um, you start listening to people and, and they'll tell you all about, you know, oh, oh, there should be no borders, people should just be able to, to just come and go and everything. Well, no, there should be borders. God has borders. He has borders established for a reason. Now, that being said, there's borders of inheritance and there's borders of land However, there was still free travel between these states, at least within that nation. So you should be able to go across any, like any of the tribes would be permitted. And, and Simeon is a perfect example of that. How would you, how would you be able to ever you know, leave if you have Judas? If Judas said, nope, no, we're, we're imposing a toll on you. We're, <laughs> we're going to build the wall around you. And if you want to get out, you've got to pay us. That's, that, that obviously wasn't, uh, wasn't God's intention. And again, they didn't do that. But, but these are the things that you know, need to be considered when we're thinking, well, hey, what is right? Well, how should we have government? So how, what, what, what is right for us to have as far as these setups go? And um, especially when you think, when you really drill into like private property, think about this. Who actually owns the land? And, and this is... This is one of my, you know, the libertarian or anarchist uh, philosophy. It's, first of all, it's just that, it's philosophy. It's based on a few axioms or principles. And one of the number one things is self-ownership, that you own yourself. And part of that sounds good, but another part of it, and this is, this is where they get it completely wrong, is that the Bible says, what? Know you not that ye are the Lord, that you are bought with a price? That there is a higher governing power than yourself over yourself. So on one hand, yes, we should have liberty to do what we want to a degree with ourselves, with our bodies, with, you know, without someone infringing upon us. But at the same time, there is a governing higher power that's going to dictate, first of all, what's right and wrong. And second, what's a crime and what's not a crime of what we do with our bodies. Because where the, where the libertarians fail... One of the major areas they fail, they say, oh, because of this, you know, uh, this philosophy that, that you own your body, you can do what you want your body, they have no problems with sodomites. They have no problem with that at all. And their whole philosophy just falls flat on its face and it's going to end up going nowhere when you don't have institute laws for a government to, to do a proper punishment against that crime committed of sodomy because 
Yes, it is a crime because the Bible says so. Because God put the death penalty judgment on it. Just because people want to say, oh, you should have the right to marry who you want to marry and love who you want to love. Yeah, you have the right to do that, but then the government has the right to enforce laws. And if it was a godly nation, there would be a law against sodomy and there would be a law that follows God's judgment of what's right and what's wrong and what's appropriate. Who are we to decide what's appropriate over God? If God says one thing and, and a man says another, I'm going to go with what God said. And people don't like that or don't want to hear it. Okay. Well, I'll tell you what. The Bible hasn't changed. God's Word hasn't changed. And for a long time, people actually followed and obeyed this. And a lot of people believe this. Just because today there may be only a few people believing this doesn't make it any less true. It just means that more and more people have been brainwashed into, except in, into these, a lot of times, brainwashed with philosophies of men. And spend more time. See, the problem is that you have, you have Christians spending more time in politics than they're spending in their Bible. And they're getting all screwed up and they're listening to all their political talking heads and they're getting all their morality from these, from these Republicans. Instead of from God's Word, where it belongs. You need, you need God's Word to dictate your politics, not the other way around. God gives borders. God gives land to the children of Israel. That was their inheritance. He's giving it to them. But who actually owns the land? Because again, ownership, right? I'm getting into this concept of ownership, right? And we're dealing a lot with ownership through the entire book of Joshua because they're receiving inheritance. They're receiving the land that belongs to them and they can't sell it to other people, you know. But who owns the land? Well, Deuteronomy... Chapter number 10, verse number 14, says, Behold, the heaven and the heaven of heavens is the Lord's thy God, the earth also, and with all that therein is. Who owns the land? God owns the land. At the end of the day, who owns everything? Well, the Creator does. God owns all of it. God made it all, and God, God owns it all. Psalm 24 also says something very similar, and I just have to turn there real quick because I don't have it in my printed in my notes here. Psalm 24. Verse number one says, The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein. Yeah, the world and the people. So you're talking about your self-ownership and your property and you're going you're gonna to base everything you believe politically off of those two axioms without recognizing, well, you know what? Actually, God owns the earth and God owns all that dwell therein, all the people. They belong to him. Because he bought and paid for everybody's souls when, with, with the, the sacrifice of his own son. When Jesus Christ shed his blood on the cross and died and rose again from the dead. That bought, purchased everybody, everyone alive. And besides the fact that God's the creator of everybody. So no, I'm not going to hinge everything I believe on some tradition of man or some philosophy of man. We're going to go to the Bible. Now, so who actually owns the land? God does. Now he's given it to people right? To, to use and for a specific function. What was the purpose of God giving this land to Israel? For them to work the land. For them to be able to survive. It's for them to continue and, and to work and to cultivate it and to grow food and to do what they need to do to survive. So God's given that land for that purpose. But there were still limitations with what you could even do with it. So just because the children of Israel owned land, I'll turn to Leviticus 19 and we'll see this very clearly. Just because they owned land doesn't mean they could literally just do anything they wanted with it. There were some restrictions. One, they had to allow people access to their land. Even though there were borders for where the inheritances were, there was still, in, in, in some aspects, you know, limitations on public use for the land so that you couldn't just completely 
block everything and everyone off. And we see this very clearly in Leviticus 19. Look at verse number nine. The Bible says, And when ye reap the harvest of your land, thou shalt not wholly reap the corners of thy field, neither shalt thou gather the gleanings of thy harvest. And thou shalt not glean thy vineyard, neither shalt thou gather every grape of thy vineyard. Thou shalt leave them for the poor and stranger. I am the Lord your God. Now, obviously, this is talking about areas of land that are being cultivated and harvested and stuff like that. So I'm not talking about it. You can never put a fence up around like your personal house, right? Or like your little yard area. This is referring to um, harvesting the land. If you have a vineyard, if you're growing stuff, that he, he gives them this, this part of God's law saying you, you cannot go. And gleaning means you are just taking every last bit Right. So if you have an orchard, right, you can't go out and just and just take every last piece of fruit from those trees. You can't just go over, now harvest. Right. Go through. Harvest your stuff, you know, harvest your crops, but do a good once over. Don't go back the second time and make sure you pick up every single last bit of food that's there and the reason why is because god is all still providing a way for the poor and for the stranger of the land to be able to feed themselves and again this is god's method he didn't say gather glean everything and then hand deliver it to the people who are in need of food and just drop it off for them and you do all the work and just give it to them no he says leave it up there for them you know what that does? That's going to make them still have to do some work for their food. They're still going to have to go out. They're still going to have to get it down. Hey, if you're hungry, you go do it. I'm not going to go and bring it off to you. You go do it. Now, as I mentioned last week, it's the same thing, you know, just so people don't take me the wrong way. Yes, there are some people that we ought to take care of and give alms to that are unable to work, that cannot go out and and go glean from these fields because they physically can't because they've lost their legs they've lost their arms they're unable to do you know for whatever the reason is they're just incapable of doing this stuff yes those people are to be cared for and you know what the church cares for those people and just people <laughs> should be able to give alms for those people but also what you see in the bible is when the people were were asking alms oftentimes you'll find that sometimes at least uh, not all the time, but sometimes you'll see them asking by the church. They go to the house of God to be cared for. And, you know, I'm, we're all for helping people when they're in need and they, and they actually need it, you know. But when someone's fully functional and capable of working, go out and work. But um, I don't want to get too far into that. Leviticus 23, 20. Turn if you would to Deuteronomy 24. I'll read you from Leviticus 23, 22. The Bible says, And when ye reap the harvest of your land, thou shalt not make clean riddance of the corners of thy field when thou reapest, neither shalt thou gather any gleaning of thy harvest. Thou shalt leave them unto the poor and to the stranger. I am the Lord your God. We see this reiterated multiple times of God deciding what you can and can't do with the land. He's putting limitations on what people are able to do. Now, it's not a lot of limitation. It's not dictating, you know, what size soda you could drink. <laughs> so you, you know, you can't, you can't have that, that super size soda because we're the government and that's not good for you and, and we're going to tell you what to do. He's allowing for, for the poor to not have to always be poor is what God's doing in a very wise way. Deuteronomy 24, look at verse number 17. The Bible says, Thou shalt not pervert the judgment of the stranger, nor of the fatherless, nor take a widow's raiment to pledge. You'll find throughout the Bible, God does have compassion and a soft spot for people who truly are in need. And what we see here, who's the people truly in need? The fatherless. It's not their fault that they're fatherless. The widow who's been left behind. Her husband's been doing all the work and taking care of her as he ought to be, but now she has no one. Yeah, these people, they need that. The stranger, people who are foreigners that, that you know, came to, the, to that land seeking a better life. They're not the enemy. 
Let me repeat that. The people who came to this land seeking a better life are not the enemy. That there ought to be ways for them to be cared for also and not pervert judgment against the stranger just because they're a foreigner and just, and just rule against them and just not do justice. Yeah, but when you listen to the Republican Party, what do they focus on all the time? This illegal immigration, all these immigrants, all these people, you know. Look, they're, they're not the enemy. You wouldn't have this problem. If we had a proper government in the scope that God has given, the immigration wouldn't even be an issue. The only reason why people get so upset about it is because they're worried about them coming and taking the funding from the government through the benefits and all the social programs and everything else and saying, oh, but they, you know, they haven't paid it. Yeah, I know. They shouldn't get it. But no one should. No, you know, we shouldn't have this money stolen from us and just given out to a bunch of people. And if you didn't have those free handouts, then what would be the problem with people coming here to work and to better themselves? Why would you not want to have more people just come into, hey, that, that's what it used to be. America used to be the symbol of freedom and a place where big government wasn't keeping you down, where they didn't have the class structure and, you know, oops, sorry, you're a serf, you're always going to be a serf. We have nobility over here and you're never going to be one of us. In America... That's why so many immigrants came to this country is because, hey, here's a place where you could just work. If you're willing to work, if you're willing to put in your hard time, you could earn a living. You can do something good for yourself and the government's not going to get involved in all of your businesses. But now that's changed. That's the way things were 100 years ago, 200 years ago. Now it's, it's, it's completely flip-flop. Now you have to get a license, you have to get permission. You know, licenses, when you hear license, think about licensing from the government, it's permission. That's what license means. So if you need to get a license, you have to get a license to cut someone's hair and get paid for it. You have to get permission from the government to get paid to cut somebody's hair. You have to get permission from the government to give somebody a ride somewhere and to get paid for that. You have to get permission from the government to do almost anything these days and get paid for it. It's licensing. Yeah, that's right. They call it business licenses to do business. Is that the government's job? Shouldn't be. Shouldn't be, but they've taken it on themselves. See, that's not the job that God gave human government. That's the job that man has given themselves in the human government. If you know anything about the foundation of this country, it's one of the things that they were fighting against <laughs> was all the taxes. But let's keep reading here. That wasn't even in my notes. That one was for free. <laughs> Verse number 18. But thou shalt remember that thou wast a bondman in Egypt, and the Lord thy God redeemed thee thence. Therefore I command thee to do this thing. When thou cuttest down thine harvest in thy field, and hast for God a sheaf in the field, that thou shalt not go again to fetch it. It shall be for the stranger, for the fatherless, and for the widow, that the Lord thy God may bless thee in all the work of thine hands. When thou beatest thine olive tree, thou shalt not go over the boughs again. It shall be for the stranger, for the fatherless, and for the widow. When thou gatherest the grapes of thy vineyard, thou shalt not glean it afterward. It shall be for the stranger, for the fatherless, <coughs> excuse me, and for the widow. Verse 22, And thou shalt remember that thou wast a bondman in the land of Egypt. Therefore I command thee, to do this thing. So before and after he tells them about not gleaning, not going back, not getting all of it, he reminds them twice. You used to be a slave. You used to be in bondage. Don't ever forget that. Don't become so incompassionate. Don't become so full of pride and so judgmental over everyone else just because you've been blessed for a while. Don't forget where you came from. Don't forget that you were once a slave. Don't forget those things when you have wealth and prosperity and then just choose to not let anyone have anything, you know, that, that needs to feed themselves. That's in the same situation maybe that you used to be in. You know, people want to come into the land, the strangers. They're, maybe they're coming out of bondage themselves. And they're just looking for somewhere to go to, to do good and willing to work and, and feed themselves, but they need a start. 
Well, here's your start. And God's saying, don't forget that. Have compassion on people. Compassion and humility. This is a great way for poor people who are struggling to be fed. And he doesn't say, again, you know, just to do all the work and just hand it out to them. No, let them do the work. If the land was blessed, think about this, if the land was best, blessed, there would be abundance and be able to support even more people. There's nothing wrong with that, but there's always a limit to what will be available. So when it comes to you know, being worried, well, what about, what if all these immigrants all just come here? Well, if they're coming here looking for a better life, they're only going to come as long as there's something to be gained. Right? So that stream of people wanting to come to any country, and it doesn't matter who it is, if they're being blessed and they think that they can improve their life to go there, great. But there's going to be a limit to that to where it's not going to be worth it to go anymore because you're not going to be able to find any work. You're not going to be able to, you know, to, to make your way. So why, why journey and, and even make that, that type of adventure? It, it would work for itself. But if you have a government that's constantly just giving out money, then, you know, you're going you're gonna to perpetuate that. You're enabling the bad behavior. But if you didn't have that going on, and people actually had to work. Well, who cares? If there's opportunity to be had, why, why do you care if someone else wants to do good for themselves? There's nothing, there, there's nothing that says, there's not even any statistical data this, to show that you know, competition's a bad thing or that having more people working and working hard is a bad thing. You could accomplish a lot more with more people willing to work. I, I say, hey, let's get as many workers as we can. People are willing to do the work, be, do an honest job, then let's do it. I don't care where you came from. <laughs> but um, anyways, let's uh, turn, if you would, to Deuteronomy chapter 19. I'm going to go a little bit into the borders now, go back a little bit to the borders. Because we're, we're reading a book that is full of clearly defined borders that belong to the particular tribes. And one of the things they used to determine property lines was the landmarks. They would have a, a specific point, you know, whether that point be a city or a natural landmark or even literally like a stone being set as a landmark. That is also the case in, in you know, many times where they'll set up, you know, something to be, this is a landmark that's dividing, you know, this, this territory, these boundaries. Uh, Deuteronomy 19, that's why there's a law regarding this also. De Deuteronomy 19, verse 14, the Bible says, Thou shalt not remove thy neighbor's landmark, which they of old time have set in thine inheritance, which thou shalt inherit in the land that the Lord thy God giveth thee to possess it. So he's like, you can't go moving the landmarks. Like, they've been established, they've been set. Why would someone want to move a landmark? To get more land for themselves, right? Just to take this and go, oh, yeah, this is actually way over here. Now all of this belongs to me. And what the Bible saying in Deuteronomy 19 is saying, you can't, you can't do that. You know, like, it's already been established and set, and that's what you get. Don't go trying to steal more land by moving the landmark over. So, hey, well, yeah, I'm using this land. Look, there's a landmark right there. You know, it's a, that's wicked. It's a, it's a form of theft. Deuteronomy 27. We'll see another, another law regarding this. Deuteronomy 27. Verse number 17, the Bible says, Cursed be he that removeth his neighbor's landmark, and all the people shall say, Amen. The Bible says, you're cursed. You do something like that, you're cursed. And uh, it's, it's a wicked sin. We also find, I'm not going to get too, too much into this, we, we find throughout Scripture, you know, there's, there's walls built. There's walls built around cities. There's walls built for protection. And it's not a bad thing to keep people safe. There's, there's no problem with, with determining who's going to come in and out of the country either. I don't think there's anything wrong with determining, you know, who's allowed to, to, uh, to enter into, into a sovereign nation. Because God has established those nations. But, like I said, I, I don't think there should be a whole bunch of extra laws you know, making it impossible for people to come in that are just trying to be a part of the, 
to actually join and be a part of that country. But see, with, with, with the children of Israel, God allowed, you know, it wasn't just, the tribes weren't just given to physical genealogical lines, you know, for that inheritance. Because the Bible says that strangers could come and join themselves to a tribe and that all the laws and they would be treated just like someone who was born in the land. And so if they join themselves to the tribe of Judah, guess what? They're going to get inheritance in the tribe of Judah. You know, they're going to be put, the, the whole point was to be part of that people. They're coming, to, the reason why they should be coming to Israel would be because they want the Lord as their God. And they want to serve the Lord, so they're going to go and join themselves under that nation, and they're going to assimilate and, and become like that people, because they're the people of God. So they decided, I'm going to move and I'm going to join, and, and God had no problem with that. He encouraged that. Yeah, let, I mean, people come, be a part of the land, be, you know, and, and don't treat them any different, is what God's law said to the people who were physically born into that land. Then you don't treat the stranger different. They still have, um, you know, rights. And I think if people want to come and be a part of, you know, this nation, especially if it's a nation that serves God, which is really not anymore, but uh, people that want to come and, and, and be a part, there should be no problem with that. It should be great. Now, uh, let's see here. Jo Joshua 19. Let's jump here to the very end. Verse number 49. The Bible says, when they had made an end of dividing the land for inheritance by their coasts, the children of Israel gave an inheritance to Joshua, the son of Nun, among them. According to the word of the Lord, they gave him the city which he asked, even Timnath Sirah in Mount Ephraim. And he built the city and dwelt therein. These are the inheritances which Eleazar the priest and Joshua, the son of Nun, and the heads of the fathers of the tribes of the children of Israel divided for an inheritance by lot in Shiloh before the Lord at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. So they made an end of dividing the country. Now, what we see with Joshua and his inheritance, I don't think it was quite as interesting as Caleb's inheritance was. Caleb went and he's like, he wanted to fight the giants and he got the best of the land, you know, and he had all that deal. When, when we're closing up, we're kind of wrapping up everything and the whole dividing of the land and it's all finally finished. We don't see Joshua just, just getting the, you know, this, this really... Um, glorious place necessarily we don't really know a lot about it the story is played out different but what we see is that joshua is the last one to receive the inheritance and that's a sign of a, of a really good leader he made sure that all of his people everyone under his command received their inheritance like a good general, right? A good, a good army general, a good military general is going to make sure, you know, if you're going to fight a war, hey, we're not leaving until we all come out, you know, and they're, look, they're, they're worried about, they're going to be the first one to step their foot on the ground and the last one to leave the battlefield if they're a good leader and leading the people. And that's what Joshua was. He led the people into the land. And when it's time, you know, everybody finally is like, you know, go and have your nerves. They divide it all up. They're finally done. And then he takes his portion. And he takes what's coming to him. And by the way, yes, he still takes what's coming to him. And I'm not going to go too far in depth in this either because I covered this already just like a week ago as far as, you know, man of God getting paid, the great leader actually receiving for what he's done. He deserved it. He fought great battles. He did, you know, if this was the most glorious place, he deserves it. We don't know if it is or isn't, but, but even if it isn't, I mean, we know that you know, Mount Ephraim was still a desirable place from, from where they came from. I don't think this is too far off from where, um, where Caleb ended up inheriting anyways. But um, we see that this is, you know, he deserves that. Um, think about the, you know, the leadership. Joshua was a good leader. He made sure his people were taken care of first. And this is the example that Jesus gave us. Jesus came to this earth to minister and to care for other people. He endured the shame of the cross and the suffering in hell before his victory of his resurrection and even before receiving his kingdom. Because now he's seated on the right hand of God the Father. But in the future, he still hasn't even been given, you know, as it were, his inheritance from all the good work that he did, but he came to make sure that everyone else gets theirs first. 
because he cares about us. He cares about other people. And that's the mindset that Christ had. This is the mind that Joshua had. And this is the mind that we ought to have too. We're not worried about making sure we get our own. Make sure you can help everybody else out to get their own and then you get your own. And, that's my, and, and in this lifetime, the way we live our lives, that never ends because you never get your own. You're, you're at least, you shouldn't have that mindset because you're not focused on the things that you could receive physically, monetarily here. We're waiting to get our own. So we live our whole lives trying to help other people to, to achieve the prize, help other people to get those spiritual rewards, help other people to, to succeed in their walk with God and help them to get as much as they can. And in so doing, in doing all that and in having that mindset, God will honor you and bless you in the end. You don't have to even be focused about yourself and you shouldn't, you don't have to be. Because once you are focused on everybody else and, may, and trying to help them out as much as you can to help their walk, that in itself is what God wants you to do. And you will be honored and glorified at the, at, at the judgment seat of Christ. That's when you can enter into, into Christ's rest. Finally, um, Turn, if you would, to 2 Timothy chapter 4. It's the last place we'll have you turn. 2 Timothy chapter 4. Second Timothy chapter 4, verse number 5. The Bible reads, But watch thou in all things, endure afflictions. Do the work of an evangelist. Make full proof of thy ministry. For I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them also that love is appearing. The Apostle Paul is someone who spent his time concerned with the needs of others and going around and ministering unto other people. But the whole time, he was still aware of the fact that if he does all these things willingly, there is going to be a prize. There is going to be a crown. He is running to win that prize, but he didn't do so in, in trying to accumulate any attention to himself or accolades to himself. It was all focused on serving others and ministering to others and getting churches started and, and getting people, you know, winning people to the Lord and doing all these things. That's what he focused on. And at the end of his life, he's able to say, look, I did, I did fight a good fight. I did keep the faith, and now I know that there is a crown laid up for me. And that's the attitude that we need to keep. Now, um, you know, Joshua 19, like I said, there's a lot of divvying up the land, and there's all these references, um, even more so than probably any of the other chapters of just the borders and everything else, which is why I tried, decided to cover some of these principles tonight. And, you know, I've finished the material that I have for Joshua 19, but I, I said I would probably get into this at the end. I'm only going to spend about a minute or two on it. But uh, since we just had you know, election day yesterday and there's all this voting going on, um, I'll just give you a little bit of insight myself. I didn't vote. And I don't think it's a sin to not vote, by the way, because I, I, I still don't get all of my principles by the, uh, you know, by the, the ruling class in the Republican or Democrat Party. But... When I, the way I look at voting, just so you all understand this, when you vote, that's what they call it an election, right? Elect is something that we also see in the Bible, something we understand, we should understand the word of. What we do when we go to an election, you're choosing. You're choosing. You're making a choice. You're saying, this is, what, this is who I want to be my leader. You're electing someone to represent you. In our form of government, that's what you're supposed to be doing. What the society has turned into is, no, 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 you're not choosing someone to represent you. You're just choosing to not have this other person. And that's what they try to sell you on. I'm not buying it. Because if I'm going to choose somebody, and people say, oh, well, you can't have someone. There's never going to be anybody that you just agree with 100%, and, and you just, they just will represent everything that you want. 
Yeah, I know, but I'm not even looking for that. How about let's start with 20%? Yeah. <laughs> How about let's start with someone who's not a crook? Right. Let's start with someone who's not just full of themselves and proud and arrogant and wants to actually serve the people and is not just looking to make more wealth for themselves. How about that? How about someone who actually has principles and believes what they believe because God said so? And not because they just want to go play this game and get a job as a politician. How about that? Show me where that candidate is and maybe I'll elect that person. But until I find someone like that, I'm not going to go and, oh, Jesus, it's your civic duty. You got to do this. No, I don't. What I see is the problem with participating in this is you continue, if you continue to accept wicked people, and support them and elect them and vote for them whether they win or not if that's the choice you have I say no let's bring on the most fascist or leftist or whatever socialist person and just go ahead and let them in charge because that's what we deserve if people don't have any integrity anymore to put up somebody who has principles to, to, to actually do the right thing Instead of just pandering to what you think people want to hear. And you know what? I, I've only been in Georgia for a couple months. And I've only listened to the radio for a very short period of time out of the few months that I've been here. And oh, there's, no, there, it, there's nothing different from anywhere else. I'm listening to these governors, potential governors speak. They're politicians. And I'm not saying that in a nice way. <laughs> it's not a good word to be used. <laughs> because they're just, say, they, they're not really saying much of anything. They're arguing about a lot of stupid things without actually getting into any substance. Now, you might say, yeah, this guy's right on this and, and, and he's wrong on this or whatever on a particular issue. But even the arguments they use are not using any real, any, any real values, any, anything that's just concrete. They're just saying things that they think the most people on their side is going to vote for. Because they don't have integrity. And I can't vote for somebody like that. No, they don't have to be perfect. But I'm not going to continue to vote for evil so we can continue to get evil people as an option. Now, this is just my little rant at the end of the sermon. You don't agree with me on any of this. I don't care. I really don't. It doesn't matter to me. You, you want to go ahead and vote? Go ahead and vote. I'm not going to, I'm not going to berate you or belittle you for not. I'm just explaining a little bit about my reasoning and, and where, I, where I stand on that. And, um, you know, the re one of the reasons I even came to that kind of a conclusion is because long ago, before I was even interested in becoming a pastor, I actually was into the politics and, and, and I wanted to make a change and to make a difference. And I thought the way to do that was by pursuing politics, by, by getting involved in government and trying to really make a good change. But it didn't take long to realize the extent of corruption for one, and it's just a big game and people just have to pay their dues and then they get rewarded with favors. And it's, and it's this little, it's this club. I mean, it really is like the, the GOP. It's the grand old part. It's a club. And, and they have their people that they, that they want to let in and whatever. And, and yeah, okay, you could go ahead and join, but when you really start to get involved with it, you'll realize where the power lies and if they don't want people to come in and, and, and make changes, you know, there's ways of, of making that not happen. And it starts even down at the, at the lower levels, there's a lot of corruption. I'm not saying every single place it's corrupt, but, and then the higher up you go, the more and more corrupt things are. But what I realized is that even if you were, let's say, let's say you did all the work you could politically, all the grassroots work, to, to get out the word and talk to people and convince people and persuade people, this is the person that you need to have ruling over you. Even if you could accomplish that, what is that really going to do? 
if you have a ruler that's going to try to make these, these right choices, even, yea, godly choices, but the people are still all wicked, what good is that going to do anybody? Because God's judgment is still going to come. Look at what happened with King Josiah. King Josiah was a godly man and did a lot of righteous things, a lot of right things. But read the book of Jeremiah side by side with when you read about King Josiah because King Jeremiah was still dealing with the people of the land and they were still extremely wicked and they still were burning incense. You know, Jer Josiah was out there trying to make laws against this stuff and yet he was blessed of God. But the people, guess what? They still ended up going into captivity. The judgment still came. They didn't repent. They didn't get their heart right with God. Even with a strong political leader. That's why I chose to focus all of my energy and my efforts not on politics, but on reaching hearts and minds of people with the word of God. Because if you can reach people with the gospel of Christ, and if you could get them hooked on this book, I don't have to worry about the politics. Not for one second. I, I, don't, I don't have to, I won't even have to tell people how to vote or who to vote for or anything like that. If you are into this book, I'm not worried about it at all. You'll have enough wisdom for me to just say, yep, go ahead, you know, do what you want. You, you, don't, you shouldn't have to rely on someone to tell you who to vote for anyways. And that's why you won't hear me telling you you need to vote for this person. I'm going to tell you this is what the Word of God says and use this to make in all of your decisions in life, whether it's to vote, not to vote, whether it's who you're going to vote for, whatever. This is what's going to change. And this, and this is, when we get people on this, then that really can have the potential to stay off you know, God's destruction, you know, God's judgment on a nation when people do turn their hearts to the Lord. So that was probably going to be one of the most political sermons that I preach for a long time. So there you go. You got the benefit of a political one. If you're a political person, you got that tonight. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for your words, God, and for giving us these uh, instructions from the Bible and, and these great teachings that we could learn um, through every single chapter, every single line that you've given us, Lord, we thank you for it. God, help us to make wise choices. Lord, teach us and guide us. And it's in Jesus' name we pray, amen.